Good evening, good evening, thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the America Society, Council, Council of the Americas. Welcome all of our members and President Circle members. We're very pleased for you all to be here today and we're very pleased to have all of you here today. I want to start by thanking our moderator, uh, Jose Enrique Arrioja. Jose Enrique is the editor at large for Latin America at Bloomberg News. Uh, prior to joining Bloomberg, he was editor of the Wall Street Journal Americas in Spanish. A native Venezuelan, he reported for El Nacional, El Universal, and was the founder journalist of Economía Hoy. Thank you, Jose Enrique, for moderating today's panel. Then Diego Ferro, right here to my left, who is uh, co-chief investment officer at Greylock Capital. Prior to joining Greylock, Ferro was co-head of Latin America fixed income trading strategy and structuring at Goldman Sachs. His bio is much bigger, but you have it in front of you. In the interest of time, I'm just going to do brief intros. Casey Regman, a director in, sorry, Casey Reg, a director in Credit Suisse Emerging Markets Economics Research Group. Casey is responsible for the economic and political analysis of Argentina and Venezuela. Before joining Credit Suisse, she was at Fitch Ratings, where she, co she covered a portfolio of Latin American sovereigns. And then lastly, Sioban Morden is the head of Latin American Fixed Income Strategy at Nomura Securities International. Before that, she was at Jefferies with a focus on distress and stress sovereign credits and at uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, right? where she was head of Latin America strategy across local and external markets. We are so pleased to have you all today. I think the timing of this event is quite relevant as we discuss in our conference call. So I don't want to take any more time. Jose Enrique, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo, so much. Um, it's for me a, a, great, a great pleasure to be here and, and delighted again. Uh, thank you to Randy and, and you, Guillermo, for putting this panel together. As you mentioned, it's difficult to find a better time to discuss the outlook for a nation called Venezuela and having the pleasure to, to have you know, Chauvin, Casey, and Diego to share with us their insights, their knowledge, and more importantly, their view going ahead. And just also a reminder that this conversation is going to be totally on the record. Um, prior to the, to the actual conversation that we're going to have here, we just discuss the main topics of what is going to be uh, um, in the subject today. I haven't shared any of the questions with our distinguished panelists. So we have further ado. We have the main questions behind the title and the subject of the conference, which is what's going to happen next in Venezuela. Now, of course, the future is as soon as April 12, eight days from now, when PDVSA will be facing $2.5 million in payment in principal and interest. All right? And this, this event comes on the heels of what was a very difficult and tensioned times in November last year, when PDVSA was pretty much in a technical default. Um, and let's get the first question out our way. Are they going to pay? <laughs> yes or no? Shoban, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the honor to just go ahead and crack and crack the first one for us. Um, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> just say yes, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. Um, but I, I think what worries me is. And I think you have to have conviction around the view. I think I had higher conviction before because when you see so much energy and effort trying to scrape up money over the past couple of weeks, reaching out, trying to get one-off financing, that concerns me. And it concerns me on a few different levels. There's a couple different scenarios to pay debt. You can take your petrodollar cash flow, set it offside, off balance sheet, and allocate for these big bulky payment months. Or you can monetize your gold reserve position. And I'm not sure if they're doing either. So you talk with everything's antidotal, everything is secondhand, and yes, they seem to have the money set aside, and they'll tell you that they're going to make the payment. But when you spend so much time and energy trying to raise the funds over the past couple of weeks, trying to find creative one-off financing, to me it is a concern because if you start to question the legitimacy or the transparency 
on the FX reserves if they actually have the gold reserves and why aren't they using them? Why aren't they monetizing that gold reserve position to make the payment? And if they're trying to attempt to raise financing through these creative one-off measures, there are very scarce options left. They've already fully leveraged up Citgo. So I think the concern is, yes, they make this payment, but how many more payments are they going to make after that? That's my bigger concern. The bigger concern. Diego, you are in the market. You are watching here with fellows, traders, and investors, every effort being made by not only Venezuela, but you know, any emerging market you know, company that comes to New York to try to raise money. Um, and we know that, for example, just, just yesterday, Reuters and, and a little bit later, uh, us in, in Bloomberg, we reported that Venezuela specifically is trying to just strike a deal with, with a, a fintech advisory for $500 million to just simply complete, you know, taking another part of, the, of, uh, of uh, additional resources to make this payment. Um, are you hearing something like that in the market? Is, is this a real thing that is going out there? That was, let's, let's put it, the source of this information was a lawmaker, Rafael Guzman, an opposition lawmaker in Caracas. Are you hearing that? Will um, they pay? You know, as following the market, I've been from Venezuela, that all the information that comes from Venezuela is suspicious at best. Uh, it's evident that they are trying to get money from everywhere they can and it's hard not to think that some of the moves against the Supreme Court might have been related to the fact that not being able to issue is another restriction, not that they can issue in the market, but it's not that they cannot place debt, but they cannot because technically it would not be legal. Um, so, but two things. Uh, when you look at the last year and a half, every time that they're about to make a large payment, the market sells off. So uh, I don't see this period as substantially different. And I recall other payments made with oil when it was trading at 30 something. So the fact that this is a country that is really getting to the bottom of their cash situation is true. They've been there a long time ago. I don't think that year over year, I think that imports went down 70% for nothing, okay? Mm -hmm. But they always amaze with their ability to come up with cash. And given the fact that it's a fairly st structurally wealthy country, my sense is that they will figure, figure out a way to get to the cash. N now the interesting thing is that you having a payment together with the, all the noise regarding the OAS, um, the Supreme Court, the reversal, and we can discuss that, you know, but I think there are two separate issues. One is the typical panic surrounding a payment that ultimately my sense is that they're going to pay and the market is going to rally. And why this happens every year and, and the market behaves at the same time, I don't know. It's not only in Venezuela, in Greece it seems to be the same pattern. So in a way, I see this, if anything, if you see the market becoming more paranoid, buying more, because I, I don't see, I think it's integral to this government to pay, and they will do anything they can to pay, and being a big, having resource, uh, access to a lot of different aspects of the government, and some of them not entirely transparent, my sense is that the money will show up. Your money will show up. That has been the, the case, historically speaking, in Venezuela, Casey. Uh, do you think that they will honor that, that uh, tradition, all right? Just last week, one of the, uh, the, uh, the ministers in charge of the economy was saying, yeah, we, we will do it. We will, we will honor our obligation as has been tradition for this country. But still, we have these reports that come like, like yesterday and all the heat rings and all the jitters uh, around, around this and the uncertainty. What's your take? I think they will pay next week. I uh, agree with Siobhan where I've also gotten less comfortable or have less conviction about how long this will go on because I think one, I, well I think first of all that what happened with the Supreme Court had a lot to do with trying to obtain external financing. And the fact that they were willing 
to push the limits of democracy so far points two things out to me. One is that in some ways I see it as a sign of willingness to pay remaining intact for now. On the other hand, I see it as a sign of desperation. Um, that and again, that the fact that they're trying to look for financing from so many alternative sources because they've been shut off not only from the market but also from multilaterals reportedly at this point. Um, so I think the situation becomes more and more precarious. I do think that even though yeah, there's fairly large amounts rumored in the press about what they're seeking and in terms of near-term lending, if you look at international reserves at the central bank's balance sheet at the end of January, you still had about $2 billion of cash plus another $6.5 billion or so of gold reserves. So I think that this payment is still manageable. But I think they have major problems with liquidity and cash management. And once you've made this payment, you may not have a lot left for the next few months. You have another important payment or a total payments for May are around another $800 million, and then you have $3.5 billion to pay between October and November. And if they had a hard time coming up with the cash for this payment between November and now, they may have, again, a hard time between October and November. And you know that picture, the increasing signs of desperation, combined with increasing signs of division within Chavismo that we've seen mm -hmm. now through this Supreme Court crisis, if you will, um, and in, in our case, a lower oil price forecast than we were working with previously makes me less comfortable overall that they'll get through this year than I was when we started the year. Uh, can I, just yeah, just absolutely. to follow up on yeah. that point, I think the point is they're cash flow negative, right? Mm -hmm. And you see reserves declining year after year, oil production is declining, and oil prices have found a plateau on the upside. So to think that with that context, they can continue to muddle through year after year is, I think, very difficult. It's clearly shifting. And the concern that I have is, with oil production declining every year, how much are we underestimating dollar liabilities? Because theoretically, when you do your cash flow, they should be OK this year and maybe using some of their reserve position. But if they're not using their reserve position, you start to question the reserve position. And then you start to say, well, if they can't efficiently manage those dollar liabilities, you can't continue to build up arrears forever. You're going to have to start paying promissory notes to the oil suppliers. You're going to have to start eventually paying down the China loans. You can't continue year after year with arrears financing before they convert into fixed liabilities. So I think now we're, in, we're entering a more interesting phase because we don't. there's a lot of unknown on the liability side of the balance sheet. And if they're cash flow negative and they can't find too much financing offshore that's 500 million or 600 million, mm -hmm. that's it. Those are, those are small pieces of financing compared to debt service that we have the rest of this year around 8 billion. So how, how that's, that's what concerns me, right? Mm -hmm. is, is you're running a negative cash flow and how are you sourcing it? If you can't source it with reserves, why aren't you sourcing it with reserves? Because there aren't too many other financing options outside of reserves. And, and speaking of financing options, and this is something I wanted to pick Diego's, Diego's brain here, because it's pretty much, you know, after the payment next week, all right, we're talking about 2.2, 2.1 billion in principal, 400 million in interest for a total of 2.5. This is only for PDVSA, okay? But then we have another payment for, uh, for uh, the Republic, the sovereign, okay, which is pretty much 437. Altogether, round number, 3 billion. That's just pretty much a number that we want you, you guys to, to go home with that. That's just pretty much the big number that this is going to be. But then we have a substantial amount of money left for the remainder of the year. And if we take, you know, for good what Casey and Chauvin just mentioned here, Diego, what are the options they might have? Are we talking about China? Are we talking about Russia? Uh, or are we talking the oil sector? I think we keep looking at Venezuela as if it's a normal country. And I think that it's been trying to tell us, the country, we're not normal, OK? And to look at it in terms of just cash flow, it might work. But why don't we assume that maybe this administration think that it's weak enough that it cannot survive not paying, and they will continue to do anything they can to pay. And it's not a matter of thinking, oh, well, because we are, again, at a point in which the same conversation could have had 
we could have had the same conversation a year ago. Okay, because if someone would have thought that a country would decrease imports 50%, they would have said no, it would have default. So I don't know where else they're going to get the money, but I think Venezuela credit event is still very much linked to regime change. Okay, as long as this regime continues in power and as long as it remains weak, I don't think it can tolerate a credit event and they will do whatever they can. And again, we can fantasize money from Russia, China, North Korea, it doesn't matter. But the money, they will do anything in their power. So I still think that maybe the events of last week give an indication of regime change sooner than we were expecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that OAS pressure may think that something can happen sooner. But for me, as long as these people remain there, I don't know how, but my money would be on the side that money will appear because they don't have any other alternative. So it's not a matter of whether, oh yeah, will they be able to get the financing? They will, because if not, not only they will leave, but it might not be pretty in the way they leave. So it has to do more kind of, not a situation that said, oh, I'm not going to pay debt because I want to pay my pensions. It's mm -hmm. just, I want to pay debt because I want to remain free or alive. And it's a different type of desperation when you go about funding money mm -hmm. from fintech or from whoever it might be. Whoever it might be. That kind of desperation that Diego is echoing here, Casey, and you earlier mentioning, uh, took a sizable hit when last week, when we saw the Attorney General, I mean, after the decision of the, uh, the Supreme Court, the reversal, quote unquote, and we're going go to go into that one, one using the quote unquote and the reversal made by the, by the, uh, the ruling of the uh, Supreme Court. And then we have the reaction from the Attorney General going public going full on the record, totally very, un almost unprecedented, I would say so, is, uh, is uh, the Attorney General, who was appointed by Chavez, by President Chavez, going and say, hey, this is, this is raising big concerns for the constitutional, uh, um, uh, the ILO Constitutional, what they call it, what they call it in there. How do you interpret that? Uh, and how do you add? Her remark, her public remarks, into your analysis? I was surprised by that. Um, I think it made plain some of the divisions within Chavismo that we hear or that we hear rumors about. Um, but I also was watching to see if there would be any other public officials that would follow up from that. You know, when we had then yesterday the ombudsman saying, no, now everything's fine. And you know, Ortega Diaz and Maduro are friends again, everything is fine. So you know, the other question I think if following on that is will she be involved in bringing any charges against the Supreme Court justices who are involved in this? If she says what they did was unconstitutional, is she gonna do anything about it? And I think that also will tell us you know, just how deeply these divisions run or how much support she may have already prearranged before she went out and made that or whatever the motivating factor for her, whoever was, if anybody was else was involved in the decision for her to go out, you know, how substantial that uh, foundation may or may not be. I think, you know, that's one of, one of the, the interesting remaining questions that we have about what happened, I guess among many, is what was the role of the military, for example, mm -hmm. in right. this whole back and forth with the Supreme Court? You have institutions like, you know, overseas security risk like AeroAsia saying that this may, be, this may be the beginning of a bigger crack yeah. into the Madurismo, okay? Uh, Diego, I see you and senior yours is smiling mischievously there, so I'm going to just also get, get your, your thoughts on that one. Let's give it to if Casey I, and then I go to you. If I could just make uh -huh. one more point yeah. on that, you know, and again, I, I think it's just important to see what the follow-on is from mm. there before making a final judgment on what's going on with Chavismo, but I think it is important to point out that you know, what the National Assembly has been wanting to do since they took office is try to use their powers to remove Supreme Court justices. And to do that, you need the involvement of the people's power fourth branch of government. And the Attorney General is part of that branch exactly. of government. So that's another reason why her role in particular is important. Of course, the 
National Assembly would probably have to also be out of contempt, which we can debate whether that's right. going to happen exactly. as well. But I just think she's an important actor for that process as well, which is important to keep in mind. Diego, how do you interpret it? those comments and, and the, the whole issue? Uh, it's hard to know exactly and what Casey says might be perfectly valid. Did you see the images of the interaction between Maduro and the uh, Attorney General? Yeah. Kind of nice conversation. Do you think that knowing Maduro if he was in disagreement with what she was doing he would have been so collegial and kind of a stage? Mm -hmm. After looking at that, I was inclined to think about a different explanation, that this was completely set up, knowing what the re reaction would be, for him to look presidential, particularly in reaction to the o OAS that was going after him. So when I have to think about judging the characters and their reactions, I think that that hypothesis sounds way more logical, because if not, I would have seen him blasting the Attorney General, looking to fire her and using any excuse in a yeah. regime that we know that is not democratic to make that appearing. And the whole thing was so staged that it looked like a U.S. presidential debate. Okay, so, so that's why, again, you know, this is a country that for me is more like the land of Oz. Everything is yeah. kind of the opposite. Where yeah. <laughs> and in this case, I'm looking into that, I'm thinking it looks so obviously staged. And who could be the audience for him to look democratic? No, no, guys, let's go to a meeting. This, this is yeah. not democratic. Really, yeah. come on. So, you know, I tend to, well, I, I know for a fact, I think it's pretty obvious, OAS is seriously, seriously trying to promote regime change. Right. The sooner the better, and I think they're fighting the good fight. Okay, because it's kind of nonsensical what's going on. But the only way to do that, and if, if you think of it, what it gave, it gave Evo Morales the excuse to cancel the meeting. Correct. Okay, not that it was not ignored. So, again, that there is a, there, there is a fracture within the Chavismo, there is no doubt. That there are a lot of Chavistas pure Chavistas who are extremely upset, upset at Maduro, absolutely. That Maduro's approval is much lower than the approval of the Chavismo is mm -hmm. also true. That this represents kind of, wow, a new era that it's the fracturists out there in the open, I doubt it, because if that was the case, you wouldn't have seen Maduro in a stage, sharing the stage with her like, oh, look at what democratic country we are. Yes, and he was very... Uh conciliatory in some way, you know, saying, hey, this is, this is showing a little bit, you know, how we can really, you know, discuss. Plurally. Exactly. Yes. Being pluralist and, 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 you, and, and we know that. Okay. Um, that is why when you are a reporter, a humble reporter like, like, like me, you need to talk to the experts. All right. So you need to just contract these points of view and see, you know, uh, you know, how do you make of this? What, what is your taking out of this? And, uh, and this takes me to another topic to you, Shaman. You that are essentially, you know, also f following the cash flow of, 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 of um, Venezuela. Um, Casey was talking about, you know, dire situation in, in prices, etc. I think that you are forecasting like a 500% inflation for this year in, in, in Venezuela. Let me ask you this. Uh, imagine that you are right now the new CEO, the new CFO, let me correct, of Petróleos de Venezuela, recently named in that, you know, really, you know, changed the board in the, in, the, in the company. And if you were right now in this situation where you have to just face the payment, next week's face payment, sizable one, what are your alternatives? What are your options, I, you know, on the table there. The problem is there's never a plan. It's so improvisational, right? The plan is to survive day by day. And clearly this is not a long-term strategy that's going to work. Um, as I said earlier, you know, they're cash flow negative. They're willing to pay until they're unable to pay. Because, yes, they're concerned about the fallout post-default and how do you immunize PDVSA cash flow from litigation risk. But you look at the numbers and they don't add up. 
So I don't think resources, unlike Diego, I don't think resources are infinite for Venezuela. And year after year, there has to be some end game here with these policies that are doomed to fail. Um, it creates chronic capital flight, import dependence, um, capacity, pr production capacity continues to decline, which creates even more import dependence, which creates even more capital flight. And the distortions are intended to fund a patronage system that supports the government as well. So you can't push imports to zero. And imports have already contracted so much, you're not going to get much more cash flow savings by contracting imports anymore. So it, um, I think they continue to pay while they're able to pay. And um, I think when I look at default, to me, it's almost an accidental default, where they have every intention to pay, but you know, there's no resources. So I, th I think if I'm in charge of PDVSA, I continue to be, I'm globally integrated, and I'm concerned about my cash flow and global integration and what would happen post default. But I don't know that I can influence change, because they've been trapped in these bad policies for years. Mm -hmm. So you know, what kind of autonomy do you have? We've, we've just recycled again. Um, Pedro is a president uh, who's apparently going to be leaving in, in the summer. Would you be able to lend some money to, to us, you know, Chauvin, Morden, CFO of PDVSA, in a situation like this one, Diego? Um, Would you be able to buy uh, any, uh, any bonds, uh, any I promissory notes, or any paper that she may issue under the current circumstances? I might be wrong in this appreciation, but I think that obviously this country has been run very pathological policies for a long time. But I think some of what I get the sense that they're trying to implement is to reduce the size of that pathology. They are really trying to figure out a way to put in jail a few people in PDVSA. They are trying to address some of the issues in the uh, drillers that are not working. Somehow, my sense is that the need for money are making them more pragmatic, but in the context of being so outside the norm, it's just a little less pathological, I would say, you know, <laughs> just to, to put it in the proper context. So, you know, for me always, the Venezuela was a, an interesting case because obviously you're saying, if they continue acting like this, they're going to run out of money. Yeah, so you have two options, either you stop continuing like that so you don't run out of money or you continue acting like that and you run out of money. And you see that so far they have always done enough to continue generating something. So, you know, talking about financing PDVs at this point in time, you know, bonds pay 20, 30 percent depending on where you are. If you get into sort of the surreal calculations of annualized yield, I think that the 17s that mature next week are yep. trading at like 300 percent yield That's if right. you really want to feel something yield. <laughs> um, so I think it has a serious problem of crowding out if you want. Why would I give them new money unless I, pre I, I lend them at 30 cents on a dollar with a yield? But that does not mean that there are suppliers, there are companies that want to engage into that. There are rich contracts to be awarded. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I think that is going to be the risk for the next administration, you know, to survive whatever challenges of the things that might be willing to sell or to pawn or to do anything at this point in time. Nobody argues that this, not, this is not a wealthy, structural wealthy country. And I think that they have shown an incredible creativity to come up with money. And personally, I don't think that China wants to have a regime, and how can I say, a disorderly regime change. And that's why my sense is that the flexibility of having s some of those lines to be diverted into mm -hmm. some directions or not can still be applied. So again, we're looking to something that is so distorted to, that applying any rational cash management uh, framework, I think misses part of the weird dynamic of this place. Of this place. Let's, uh, let me ask one additional question to Casey, and then, because we wanted to make this one very, very interactive with you guys uh, that are you know, uh, with here today, I'm going to take some questions as well, all right? Uh, so you can help in my role to, to squeeze 
the last drop of knowledge from, the, from our speakers today. Uh, Casey. But there is a page next week. Uh, all this tenterhook situation, you know, goes away. Uh, and we are, as Diego is saying, you know, in this uh, situation. Um, are we going to see uh, reprofiling of the debt? Are we going to see uh, restructuring of the debt for the remainder of the year? What is what is your take? What comes next, formally speaking, from from the government, according to you, to your uh, your analysis? Well, I think they've shown that they're willing to consider all kinds of alternatives in their quest to continue paying. I question how easy it would be to pull off another exchange type transaction now that you have Citgo 100% pledged and again they're having trouble coming up with other uh, well they're having issues on the legal front in general in terms of legal framework and in terms of people being comfortable um, with the commitments that the sovereign can make at this point given the status of the National Assembly so I mean, I th don't think we can rule out anything. I mean, as mm. Diego said, these guys are going to do anything they can to pay, and they're going to try to find lots of different ways to do it. But um, I think that the viability of the strategies that they have remaining it has deteriorated in quality relative to a year ago or a year before that. And that's part of why this is an unsustainable situation. <coughs> unsustainable. Shoban, your take. After next week. So I was looking at next week as being important because I wanted to know how they were going to source the, the funds for the payment. So again, if they source it with one-off financing, then that concerns me because to have conviction on them to muddle through, you need to know that they can set aside cash flow for these payments. So it concerns me um, how they fund the payment. If they fund it from reserves, then you almost feel like the countdown process has started. And I don't think it will be this year, especially because symbolically, why default in October on the next on the bond, which is just recently restructured and has the Sitco collateral. I think for uh, Pride alone, that's that payment will be made, and then the November payment is small is is a similar amount. It's around a billion, but the problem too is you've got some bulky coupon payment months as well which, you know, those are also hurdles. So I feel like we've been on coupon or payment watch now for the past couple months. And I think that coupon payment watch process will continue. And um, then you, you just have to, and I think the inefficiency is there's no data transparency. So you're measuring the output, which is a very inefficient way to assess the timing of default. And I think it's very much switched from a couple months ago when there was complacency and focus on muddling through and you know, kind of postponing that event of default. Now the cash flow stress has reached a phase where you have to worry about the timing. So again, I think they'll continue to pay while they can. I'm not calling for default in, in 2017, although I do have less conviction on that view. And I don't know about 2018. Um, and that's something that I haven't said before. I mean, I, I have to start to think about the time frame, and that is a concern. And, and that will continue to develop as you continue to watch mm -hmm. the cash flow. And there is no plan. You know, they want to avoid defaults. Clearly, they want to avoid any risk of a disruption in their cash flow that they need to fund the regime. Um, How much money do they have to pay next year in terms of principal, principal, you know, in debt service I mean, as a whole? It's a little over 8 billion, it's like 8.3. Yeah. It's a little billion. bit less than this year because, yeah. yeah, they don't have as many amortizations. You have a billion on the many 18s, I think. Mm -hmm. I have it. Um, mm -hmm. But still high coupon payments. You never get relief yeah, from the coupon payment months. 8.3 billion, you know, <coughs> Casey, I'm pointing here. But if you make a simple math, a very, you know, kindergarten math, you know, you have that amount of debt service due in the next two years, coinciding with the political transitions, you know, the, the elections to take place in, in December 2018. Um, but you have international reserve at 15 year low, equivalent pretty much to a little bit more than $10 billion nowadays. And this is going to, to your point of how you're gonna finance that. You come for a country, Argentina, that already you know, went through this process painfully, Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know already how Venezuela is part of this 
Garcia Marquez, Realismo Magico in here, all right? A very, very uh, um, high exponent of this. How, how, just help me to understand this because this is the thing that I, I, I just simply cannot get it, you know? How are they gonna get the money for this? Well, I, I still think that every time there is a payment of Venezuela or PDVSA, there's gonna be the same angst. But if they cross 2017, they have fewer payments and they have an election within a year in which, yes, they're unpopular, but the opposition is divided and they can just figure out a way to proscribe a few candidates and they can get another lease in life. Uh, that these policies and the cash flow situation is unsustainable is evident, but it doesn't have to sustain in time. It has to get until the election, and they have to give them enough resources, knowing that the Chavismo has enough of a base, that if they produce some magic, it sounds surreal and stupid, but I don't think that some of the people are not looking at things that way. So look at the paths. Okay, I default, I open a Pandora's box, I don't know what's going to happen, or I try to promise whatever to the Chinese, the Russian, or whoever, to get to next year, muddle through, hopefully oil remains more or less like this, and I have a shot at the election. Uh, so I don't think that is irrational. And going back to the example of Argentina or Ecuador, I don't think that a default, in, in those countries, the default had political value to the government. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not paying because I'm giving you the money. In this case, it's not culturally relevant. All the debt was issued by the Chavismo, or 95% of the debt. Yeah. And you have 100% of your exports linked to oil that, by definition, is going to trade at a deeper discount once you default. So you wish a default would help anything. Okay? So if you think that the country has exports, you know, at the level, whatever exports they have, they might be better off using whatever exports as you have to make the payments and continue that the loss in export revenue that they're going to save for once they default mm -hmm. plus the chaos. So I don't think that the willingness to pay that this country has shown is irrational. It's beyond rational. Beyond. Okay. And now why they complicate their life by such crazy policies, who knows? You're Venezuelan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. at, at a level yeah. this whole situation makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why I think that the goal, as you said, is just short term. But yeah, this payment made <sighs> with Dutch one. I at see. the end of the year another one. And then they get to two thousand eighteen and they're gonna be celebrating. I would argue yeah. it is mm -hmm. not as easy necessarily in 2018. If you're going to have elections, it may not be as easy to continue compressing imports. If you're going to have free and fair elections, then <laughs> well, okay, okay, then, okay. then, okay. then you are going to well, then you <laughs> or well, and and then there may be less tolerance in the international community for elections that are not free and fair based on what we've seen over the last few days and maybe less tolerance domestic. I mean, I think there's a lot of question marks about that, but I just think it's important to keep in mind that if you are going to have elections, you're going to have more pressure on the import side that could complicate the cash flow picture. The cash flow I'm just, I think that a great event may happen next year, but if you have regime change. Because I think a new government may come in and say, look, you know, but on a positive side, maybe mm -hmm. voluntary profiling in the context of a rally. For them to just do it next year would be just to give up the election and create a level of chaos that, I might be wrong, but again, you have a situation of a country that has broken, a government that has broken a lot of rules. The, the risk, the, the legal risk, once you get a normal government, is going to be massive. So not living without enough control of the transition, mm -hmm. you open up a lot of very real risk for these people, so that's why I think that whatever crazy thing they can do to continue the show, yeah. and they're doing it. The, so the other thing yeah. too, the opposition has 
never said, as far as I've seen, that or recommended default, and Ricardo Hausman is not part of the opposition, mm. or at least not part of any of the parties. He's not a paid consultant. He's, he doesn't have a clear connection with any of the leading opposition parties. So um, this view that default or default equals transition or transition equals default, I think I think some of those, I think you really have to review those assumptions. Those assumptions. And are you ruling out, if I heard okay, if I heard uh, rightly, are you ruling out any credit event this year, you said, and that may happen next year if we have I, a political transition? Well, for me, the issue, and I, I, I know that the opposition says no, and I'm not saying that a credit event is bad. My point is that their cash flow needs in the context of restarting the this, they may realize that they need a Uruguay type deal, not necessarily a unilateral, something friendly or not. What I'm saying is that they're going to be in a political position to at least attempt it. Well, and, mm -hmm. and I agree. Okay. I agree too because if you if you talk about a political transition, that determines recovery value. You know, you you don't care whether it's an NPV negative yeah. transaction like Uruguay in 2003 or a 25% haircut in capital. The debt burden is not the burden. The burden is policy mismanagement. So for your exit yield to be closer to 10 as opposed to 20 or 30, that requires a political transition because you need an economic transition. So that, to me, is, is critical. So the relief rally that you get from a political transition, yes, there will be some uncertainty, but you need that political transition as the prerequisite for economic reform that will then give you higher prices than you have today, whether it's with a haircut or an MPV negative transaction, explicit haircut and capital, maturity extension, pick your restructuring formula, but it's that exit yield with a political transition that will, that will determine, I think, uh, a much higher recovery value for investors. For investors in here. Let me just start opening the microphone here for the members of the audience, and I have a, a couple of questions in here. Please, uh, the, let's start with this lady that is in. Yeah, uh, you know, if you can just simply say your name and state the question, please. Okay. That would be phenomenal. Uh -huh. uh, my name is Sarah Glendon. I'm at Gramercy. Um, so my question is, there's been a lot of discussion about April, and it seems like there's sort of a general consensus that they will pay. But my question is, because we all may wake up on April 12th and they may not pay, <laughs> and everyone's question is gonna be what next? And there is this theory that default equals regime change, but my question is sort of, if, if we wake up on April 12th, or not even wake up, but it happens in the afternoon, at any point during that day, if there's a default, what do you think happens then? So what are the next steps? Do you think that bondholders accelerate? Do you think there's discussion of a reprofiling, a refinancing? Do you think that another Chavista takes over? Do you Bond think prices that- fall. <laughs> well, okay. that part yeah, I got. Yeah. I, got I got that part. Now. Yeah. No. But, but and I know nobody can draw this map clearly, but mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I think there's a lot of complacency in the market right now, personally, and I, I think that there is a, a relatively higher risk that we see a default in, in well, on April 12th, and and therefore I want to sort of be prepared for what yeah. people might think would happen next. What I would say is that. If there is no announcement of them intending to default, chances are that for whatever reason they didn't get all the money and the wires are... So the first thing is going to be getting into some sort of, you know, delay, you know, but not essentially a default, okay? Grace period. There isn't a grace period. There's a grace period. <laughs> <laughs> not on the... But, you know... Tell me, when was the last time that a bond was accelerated in emerging market? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm literally just asking because I don't know. So, good luck accelerating a bond. I think the problem, though, is if they don't pay, when are they going to pay, and what's the decision that they make? You know, is it going to be Argentina, June 2014, where we accept, expect them to cure the default at some stage? or? Do they recognize that this is the next step and they can't make the payments going forward? To me, the concern is, and whenever I look at Venezuela, I always try to think of worst case scenarios, only because we're now in one, <laughs> which I don't think many people would have expected a couple of years ago, in terms of full-blown autocracy and a perpetuation of, of failed policies. And I think what concerns me is the time lag between default and regime change. I do think that eventually PDVSA will be exposed, the cash flow will be impaired, and that that will undermine 
the Maduro regime and Chavismo, but how long does that take? And I'm not a legal analyst, but I don't think it would be overnight. You'll have an immediate impact with a, a higher uh, price discount in terms of PDVSA basket oil prices, but to really attach assets to interrupt PDVSA operations, how long does that take? And in the interim, not having a solution or not knowing if they're going to cure the default, if they're setting aside funds, it's. Um, I think that that's the uncertainty that we would face the next day. Well, and because it's Venezuela, yeah. the communication may not be very clear at the time either, right? So I think we have to probably assume there'd be a lot of confusion and a lot of running around on headlines and if a lot of trying you to recall, recall and there was, I think that the case that we're going back to a market precedent, if you want, mm -hmm. Ivory Coast, when the president didn't want to leave presidency after they lost the election and they got into civil war again, the restructured bonds didn't pay for like a year, the market just waited and then it was paid. Yeah. And it continued, everyone living happily ever after. At the end of the point is that usually you accelerate when you expect something out of the acceleration. If, if based on the description, go and accelerate. What do you accomplish? So I agree the chaos type situation, but my point is that it's going to be a little much ado about nothing that you can do effectively. And if you can't accelerate uh, because of delays with the paying agent or, or the administrative delays, then that kind of feeds into the waiting process, right, of that uncertainty of not knowing, you know, how do you cure this default and waiting for that regime change to happen and almost needing, need, needing to shut down PDVSA in order to defund Chavismo for that regime change to happen. That, I think, is the uncertainty, and, and maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe we're wrong. The gentleman next, next to Sarah in here. Uh. Hi, uh, Andres. Quick question. Uh, do you see any uh, profile difference between PDS and Venezuela? And if you don't, why does Venezuela trade at a premium? I, I can talk about this for, unless you want to. No, 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 please. Um, <laughs> I think I, I've looked at the, the prospect of a selective default, and it is disconcerting that the PDVSA 22s trade almost two points at price discount to the Veni 22s which is the only real bond for comparison on the curve. Um, and I think PDVSA is more vulnerable because it has the amortization payments coming up as opposed to the sovereign. But when I think about a selective default, and there's been all sorts of conspiracy theories, I think selective default is difficult because if you try to recreate a PDVSA 2.0 or shell company, to, you know, kind of like a bad bank concept to um, avert your liabilities, then how is PDVSA ever going to raise enough capital um, and CapEx to fund operations. I, I mean, that, that's a path towards isolationism, which I think is, it would be a difficult path for PDVSA. And the other problem, too, is when you look at their stock of liabilities and their stock of debt, it's very much integrated, right? I mean, PDVSA has payment arrears to oil suppliers. Um, the sovereign has FX claims with importers. The ICSID claims are a sovereign liability, not a PDVSA liability. So when you have so much integration between the two entities and you look at their stock of debt, I think it would be very difficult to separate one from the other. Mm -hmm. um, let me just interject in here and just, you remember when I say, quote, unquote, you know, the, 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 the ruling from the Supreme Court um, and, uh, you know, the reversal, you know, the Supreme Court uh, rulings that was, were announced at, you know, Saturday. I wanted to pick, you know, cases taken here and, and ask you, well, let me just give you this background because probably you don't know. That. Well, let me just ask you this. How many of you think that the Supreme Court actually reversed <coughs> most, a good part, of the original ruling session last week. I'm going to tell you because I'm a journalist, correct? And, and you know, we report on this and we say, we actually say, yes, you know, Venezuela avoids the brink of default and, and dictatorship, et cetera, after the Supreme Court just went back to the original uh, decisions. Uh, but it happens, and this happened only today, that we as a regular, regular, you know, uh, citizens have access to the actual rulings, and they only changed only one graph. And there was 
the graph on the load maker's immunity. But the rest of the rulings, giving a special powers to the Supreme Court, giving a special powers to the executive branch to engage in joint ventures in oil and other, and other very relevant matters, I just think attack. Question for you, Casey. Um, is that so going to still support in decay for the OAAs in, uh, in, in Washington to keep pushing for this regime change in here? Are they going to be successful? What are the chances that we're going to be, we, that we actually going to see a real reversal of these rulings that we know that are not only the rulings made last week, but they date back to October of last year when they started to just to take power from the uh, Assemblée Nationale? Well, that's the point that I would make is that it, no, it wasn't a full backtrack in the first place and you did leave in part the provision about the joint ventures which is part of the reason that I believe that this was driven by financial interests um, you know, primarily but um, you know we didn't we didn't go back to the status quo all the way and the status quo previous to these rulings itself was already a constitutional crisis where you've had the National Assembly in contempt for an extended period of time. You have delays on calling gubernatorial and local elections. Um, so we were already in a situation that had the OAS up in arms, that had, the, had Venezuela on the international community's radar screen. Now we're not quite as bad as we were on Friday, but we're certainly not a, any better off than we were on Tuesday of last week. So I think in that sense, Venezuela is going to continue to be a priority for those that have started to focus on it. I think the more important question is, is Chavismo going to succumb <coughs> to international pressure? Can the OAS do anything with the resolutions or even if it invokes the democratic charter? Does that have an impact on Chavismo? I think the clearest impact is going to come from the economic channel that's going to come from if you have more uh, stronger sanctions from the US or any threat of interruption to market access in the US may get more uh, of a reaction from Chavismo than simply passing resolutions through the OAS. There's plenty of protests and you know Venezuela still has some allies there and uh, we saw the Venezuelan representative leave in a huff yeah. yesterday. You know, that plays well at home. And also keep in mind that the Venezuelans have been trained by the Cubans. And the Cubans were kicked out of the OAS and, you know, they turned further inward and they played that to their advantage domestically as well. So, you know, I think uh, we have to think more in terms of what's going to really be impactful is probably going to be once you start to threaten the cash flows. Uh, more so than simply just making, putting on pressure in terms of, of <coughs> statements and resolutions and, and things like that. Coming in there. Question for the audience in here. Yes, gentlemen, please, in front row. Thank you, Rafael Santandreo. The question is, they basically, with the Supreme Court ruling, they basically burned the house to, to sell the furniture, okay? If you have your pockets full, that is, you have 10 billion in reserve, why could you do that? Um, what do we know, really? Have you, are, are you aware of any real transaction going on with the gold, if it exists? Why they are not using the gold? Why they haven't monetized the gold? Because I understand in October, they got, I, I guess they were surprised. But now they have five months, six months to do it. Why they haven't done it? Um, you know, it's interesting, they used to break down the details of gross reserves in their uh, monthly balance sheet from the central bank, and they haven't done it for the past two months, which I think is curious. But I don't know if there's data manipulation, because we've seen data revisions where they release a bulk of data, and we've seen that with the balance of payments data, and there were revisions, historical revisions that were kind of out of sort, and we saw that with the national accounts data too. So the data has been consistent, so it doesn't look like it's been subject to revisions or manipulation that suggests that they're hiding a lower amount of assets. And they've got 7.2 billion in net gold, and they've used that before, they've monetized that gold before um, with swaps and, and whatnot. So it's not clear to me why 
They know the payment's coming. It's a fixed payment. We know what date it is. It's not clear to me why they haven't monetized that reserve position. I think the data is legitimate. I, I, I don't know why. Diego, do you have something coming in there? There was a lot of market reaction when reserves got as low as 10 billion. Uh, I don't think that there is any practical reason why 10 billion is important and 11 wasn't. And, but I would assume that they would prefer to get other sources of financing and keep reserves at a minimum of 10 billion. Maybe when they use those reserves is just to make the payments at the end of this year or the payments in, in uh, we got, 2018. We got, to, we got to a low of 2.4 billion of operational reserves in 1994, if I remember correctly. But 1994. Yeah. Yeah, but we're talking about a different. But but to Diego's regime, but to Diego's know. point, the reserves are your insurance policy, so it's the last resort, right? I mean, you don't want to get down to 2.4 billion because right after that, we had regime change and IMF program and um, bankruptcy. So I, I understand the reluctance, but to me, it's that's why it, it almost supports why they wouldn't default because why would you default when you have the reserves? Um, you know, it, it, to me, they always look for to survive the next day. So if they don't have any external options, then at some point you use reserves. And when you start to hit zero net FX reserves, then your accidental default, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the other one here, the third row. Uh, Um, I, I just like to, to make a couple of observations on, you know, kind of an alternative view to some of the things that have been discussed. And, you know, the issue as to why they have been scrambling for money could be explained by the fact that you have new kids in the block. So you have new people that were named uh, CFO of PDVSA and other positions, and they have been trying to, you know, find other sources of cash for different purposes. And part of that purpose uh, could be the fact that they want to increase imports, and for that they need cash, and they need to increase imports so that they can produce some sort of growth going into next year, because as part of their explanation is the fact that if you were able to produce a growth of some sort, even if it's small, they could be more competitive from uh, a political standpoint going, going into next year. Um, I think that... Um, you know, in terms of why they don't use the reserves and so on, I, I think that they really don't think in terms of typical uh, central banking uh, theory. If uh, they need to pay and the regime is at stake, believe me, they will not hesitate, not even for a second, to use reserves. Um, so um, um, the, the, the last thing I would say is that, uh, uh, you know, before they default, one alternative they could do, and I am surprised they haven't it done yet, it's to either nationalize the banks and or through administrative means grab all the dollars that the banks have <coughs> because the banks do have dollars and they do have, have much I've heard only around 100 million I think they have because they've you know, done that before they did that back with to fund Sitme in 2010 well uh, the, you know when I say dollars it's the net dollar position which could include some of the bonds that they have so they could grab you know, a few billion dollars of bonds in the hands of the banks, just go there and sell whatever they want to do with that, and they could get some money out of that. So, so I think that before we see a default, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see a full nationalization of, of, of the banks. Okay. It's just an, you know, an alternative view to what you know, have been said here. Yeah, and I, I think you're right about that, and I've heard about those rumors, and it confirms that they're taking more and more desperate steps to remain solvent, which I think I is think the concern. I think that we go back to the whole point. Reducing imports 50% year over year, mm -hmm. it goes as desperate as you can have. Having people waiting in line for eight hours. So, you know, it's kind of funny because we're seeing the same pattern of behavior and we're surprised that, how are they doing this? It's Venezuela. And they're, they're still okay. doing it. They've been doing this for quite a while. What is your projection in terms of imports? You know, if, if we take the price of oil that has been, you know, right now, so, you know, hovering on, you know, fifty fifty dollars for WTI, for the Venezuelan basket has been, you know, s roughly forty two dollars, you know, average in the first three months and something. Um, given given this macroeconomic environment, knowing your projection of, um, you know, inflation skyrocketing again this year. What do you see imports and the amount of imports vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis last year? 
I have them up slightly, uh, but more driven by the higher price for the oil import component, whereas the non-oil import component, I assume, remains more or less stable. And that's what, uh, 19, 16 billion, 16 billion dollars? In I, it's in just over 20. 20 billion so dollars for, uh, for that. And that represents a sizable, a sizable you know, decline versus last year, correct? They, 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 uh, well, actually, probably, probably going to be just like an even, you know, if we take last year. I have a decline of 18% in non-oil imports. Um, and we, we start to see that in the early data in terms of their main trading partners, mm -hmm. but they, they, you can't decline by another 50% because then you're not left with anything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, um, you know, we went from imports of 50 billion to 40 billion to 35 billion to 25, you know, there's going to be less and less financing, yeah. margin of financing with import compression. Another question for the audience? Do we have in there? Let me ask you this. And this is also almost like a trivia question for all of you in here, uh, because according to the IMF, Venezuela may be poised to have six years of economic contraction in a row, dating from 2014 to 2019. This is how atypical this situation may be. And um, according with the, with the data that we have compiled here at Bloomberg, this uh, uh, hasn't happened in the recent history of the country, at least since 1980, when you know the IMF started compiling, compiling this uh, this data, and we have projections for an economic contraction that people, you know, of course, call uh, depression, uh, six percent. 10% capital economics in London is projecting a, a, a contraction of almost 20% of Venezuela GDP for this year. That is striking to just put a, a, a number in there. Um, have you seen something like this? I mean, since you, Diego, as well, you, that have witnessed so many examples of, of this, can we think of any case that relates to? The, the, what's going on right now in Venezuela that help us here, the members of the audience, to understand? I, I think the difference, though, in Latin America, and that's been my area of expertise, is that it's been, well, I can't say mostly democratic, let's say 80s forward, mostly democratic countries, so the uh, extreme recession, even one or two years, would force a regime change and would force an economic fix. but. When you have a fully autocratic regime, the political cycles are not vulnerable to the economic cycles. That's why it persists multi-year. I think that's the problem. The other thing I would note is that at this point, we don't have any data on the national accounts since the third quarter of 2015. Yeah. So mm -hmm. trying to project from that basis out to 2019 is like forecasting. Yeah, forecasting. We're forecasting on forecast at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, I had some conviction last year on what on what 2016 would be, but 2017, even, I, even then I had a range of GDP collapse of, I initially started with 18, I'm like, oh no, that can't be right. So then I went to 13 and it was probably 16 or something, so. I mean, I think you can track certain variables, you can try to have a sense for what direction the economy is going in and, and you know, imports obviously, as we keep discussing, is a key component of that. Um, this is an economy that after all the years of underinvestment cannot grow without some level of imports. And we also see the toll that the FX restrictions are taking on the population and the economy. Um, so I think in that sense, you know, the direction can be more easily determined than the actual level of, of change at this point. Do yeah, you take? Uh, I wonder how the IMF calculates this because I remember talking to some people there and in the context of, okay, let's assume that you have the government and calls you, what would you recommend? And says, we haven't been there in years. We haven't seen a number. <laughs> it would take us like six to nine months to figure out what's going on in that country. So for them to have the nerve of predicting a GDP when they recognize they don't have the number, I don't know where they're pulling from. So <laughs> I find the whole exercise irrelevant. Yeah. I personally think that whether the economy goes up or down is going to depend on imports and it's going to depend on all prices. If all prices remain at this level slightly higher than what OPEC wants, 
you know, the, the Venezuelan basket this year is much higher than last year. Yeah. So the money will show up for them to pay and imports are going to be higher. And if imports are going to higher, Venezuela will grow. Okay, grow. One, two percent. You know, I, I, again, <laughs> it's like saying that the government is trying to be more rational. Okay, yeah. we're coming from such a low level that, you know, it's, I would find it that it's more likely that at some point in time within this year and next year the economy goes up than down just than because down. of the the inertia of coming down is bound to bottom out and rebound to some extent. Take a look coincidentially before before coming here I placed a call to a uh, um, well-regarded economist in, in, in Caracas Efraín Velázquez um, who is the director of the economic council in there um, and he also works, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, in a um, private firm who is part of the partner in there. And this is his, his projections. And the, I asked him, hey, can I share this with the audience, you know, in this? And this, he's projecting pretty much uh, um, the Venezuelan oil basket uh, at $45, okay, for this year. And that's going to give him uh, pretty much import for $19 billion. In, in 2017, all right? And with that, with that amount of money, you know, with that um, oil price, GDP can grow 1%, according to his numbers, all right? Uh, uh, but guess what happens if, you know, the numbers go lower, if it goes, you know, $40, then he thinks that Venezuela will have to just keep squeezing imports. Right? And that it seems to be, as you know, you're pointing here, Diego, a very, a very difficult situation. He is forecasting right now an inflation that is already, you know, he told me I'm already, I'm already surpassed by reality of 354 percent, and just given the, the the behavior of the first, the first month of the year, uh, and he's also he's also uh, coinciding with you that they're going to be paying. Now, another friend. Alejandro Grisanti of Analytica, all right, just issued this report last week, a very, a very end of last week, and just tweeted overnight, saying that he is, for the first time in quite some time, concerned about the prospect of a potential default in the coming days. And this is, a, you know, Alejandro was, was at Barclays here in, in, in New York, uh, went back to Venezuela recently, and he worked with Pedro Palma, who is, you know, one of the you know, very uh, well known of uh, economies in, in the country. So there, there are these two views from these two, you know, economies from Caracas, not really agreeing on the, on the outlook of this. Well, he said that he's concerned that it may happen. Mm -hmm. He's not saying that it's not. Correct. I would say that every time there is a payment, there is risk of an accident. Okay, and as it was said before, given the fact that you have new people and trying to come up with the money and going back to the whole issue that if the money doesn't show up on the 12th, it may show up on the 14th, you know, how do you define the accident but that there is no intention mm -hmm. to default? I think it's fairly clear and I think that if things continue the way they are, I don't see why they would default this time. Are you invested in, in PDVSA bonds, uh, Absolutely. Uh, Diego? And um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm proudly so. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> you know, I'm, I was thinking what I would do in 2018 when the 17s don't exist anymore. Okay, that, you that's know, maybe I should retire after that. You know, <laughs> I will be heartbroken. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do after you know yeah. the payment is done, and 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 then we're gonna have the big question mark that you know everybody here agree on. You know what is going to happen with the remainder of the year, and this is of course a segue to how to play this, you know, and the strategy, you know, of the day after going a little bit with, with Sara uh, questions. No, uh, for me it's kind of interesting because part of the reason I like the 17s is that they obviously as long as they pay, you get the money back, and that gives you two observation points: one in April and one in November to figure out what the next trade is, because I still think that the whole thing hinges upon the political nature. You know, in, in previous year, you always roll it for the next one because you're gonna have the pull to bar of things that are about to default, uh, to, to pay, to, to mature, and that would go higher in price. 
I'm not sure about 2018. Uh, I think that towards the end of this year, I think it's going to, I personally will feel more comfortable about the chances of regime change or not, what happens in the election. If these people, I feel them to be in power, I think 2018 will get paid because they need for that to be the case. And if not, you just start thinking about reprofiling and going, you know, at, at some low value bonds or, or bonds that are protected with without CACs like mm. the Venezuela 27s because, you know, I don't think a reprofiling will be a bad thing at some point in time, but in the context of a program, in a context of reprofiling and figuring out how to save cash flow or something creative. But that, for me, is after 2019 or in 18 if there is early election. I'm having early election. Shoban, you take, you view, you know, from this strategy's point of view, um, what do you, what do, what do you, if you are recommending something already to, to, in, to investors, to people that goes to, to Nomura and say, hey, what should I do, you know, after April 12th? Yeah, we, you know, I've had a lot of discussion whether there would be a relief rally after the payment. Um, and I think it, it, it goes back again to how they source it. If they show that they're cash flow negative and they need one-off financing, whether it's external financing or reserves, then it's a concern for the two-year, four-year sector of the curve because then you're in that process of thinking that the default could be sooner as opposed to later. So the trades that we look at are kind of curve flatteners or price compression. You know, as Diego mentioned, the 27s don't have CACs. So there could be, it's a benchmark, it suffers from benchmark liquidity, but as we see in some of the stressful days like last Friday, but um, I think there would be a technical legal bid for that bond. So switching out of the higher cash price bonds, if you can try to get the same yield, like the 22s are very expensive. Um, and those are amortizing bonds, and I think some of that cash pr price reflects the fact that it's a, it's a shorter maturity bond, but you're getting a similar current yield to a lot of the 9% bonds, whether it's the 31s or the 35s. So I think you have to be much more careful in terms of instrument selection and prioritizing um, lower cash price bonds and price compression. Mm -hmm. Casey, I know that you know you role a political analyst, political and economic analyst. Of course, you by compliance, you cannot share that. But you know you can you can walk us through what you know what is Credit Suisse point of view on, on, on the recommendation of you know what you guys have in mind for uh, for um, um, Venezuelan bonds. Yeah. So yeah, we have a I have a colleague who does the strategy for Latam, and we don't have any outright recommendations on right now Latin, on Venezuela. And, and that's because you are too concerned about about you know what's it that is dicey political outlook in in, in there or or just simply uh, what's the reason? Uh, I think that we should refer to my colleague on that. Okay. One. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very good. Now comes the question that uh, you know I'm sure is everybody's mind in here, which is what are the likelihood that we're going to see a political change, you know, in uh, or at least let me put it in this way, a modification on the uh, government's policies so far. Are we going to see the, Ch the Madurismo, the continuation of whatever is left of, of the Chavismo in, in Venezuela, keeping the same, the same track, keeping a very, you know, uh, Venezuela into the Socialismo, Patria Muerte, um, what do you, what you should call? I think the problem is ideological constraints plus funding constraints. So all of the pricing distortions feeds the patronage system of Chavismo support. And there's been, you know, when they used to announce FX measures, everyone used to be like, oh, FX yeah. measures, FX measures. Now they've, they've recently announced FX measures and we're like, FX measures, you know. <laughs> uh, so with this track record of disappointment, it's hard to think that they're only just tweaking failed policies. Um, and I think that the fundamental constraints are the ideological constraints, um, operational constraints, maybe no consistency or clarity between the team, constantly turning over and shifting and, and decentralizing economic policy, and also the, the distortions necessary to fund Chavismo don't, don't really motivate you know, a freely floating exchange rate. I, 
think it's hard not to see regime change coming. Uh, it's hard not to think. I thought you were talking about e economic change. Are you talking about political regime? Yeah, both. Oh, okay, Both sorry. in some ways. Yeah. So, but you know, it's perfect because, you know, Diego, yeah, we will go back to you. Um, it feels that the Chavismo is coming to some sort of end. Uh, but obviously it will depend on the competency of the opposition. If you think how, in a way, you can blame to some extent the Vatican for trying to uh, broker some conversations, but it clearly took the energy out of the opposition and it allowed this administration to regain a lot of power and delay the whole issue of the recall referendum. So, you know, for me, the lack of Polit economic change with this administration, it's, it might be ideological, I think it's extremely weak, okay? It's very weak, and there are so many factions within the Chavismo, and yeah. so many, uh, that, that it makes it very difficult to have consistent, there were a lot of measures that were approved and suddenly didn't happen, okay? And it got the translation between the measures were taken and they were never implemented. So, and that's part of the reason why I also think that any credit event or anything can happen is so difficult. Even the, the swap that they did, it was back and forth whether we do it or not at what level. And so I think everything promotes inaction and inaction should lead to regime change. Uh, hopefully it happens sooner rather than later, but my sense is that if not, we're going to just somehow muddle through and hopefully there is, I don't see how this administration can survive through muddle through to win the election in, 2000, uh, in 2018 mm. in December. But my sense is that the chances of an accident happen before, some sort of social protest that end up with too many people dead, hopefully it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. it, it feels that the situation is likely to escalate, and the closer we get to the election, the more likely something like that happen. happen. Casey? Well, I would just add that on, on a personal level, I hope that the situation is resolved sooner than later, just because you know, it's a tragic humanitarian crisis that the country is going through. So we can sit here and talk about all these different yeah. market implications, but I think we should also keep in mind that a lot of people are suffering in unimaginable yeah. ways yeah. and just hope that it gets resolved in the best interest of the population as quickly as possible. Yes, it's definitely a situation that, you know, is regardless where you know you, you ask, you know, um, any regular citizen in Venezuela nowadays that has to make uh, super long lines to just buy bread or, you know, a piece of cheese or, or let me tell you this anecdote, you know, that uh, you have an employee just to buy just to buy a power outlet, okay? Just a regular power outlet is the equivalent pretty much to 15 days of minimum salary, all right? Which is something that uh, is the most you know hard to uh, unfathomable in, in so many in so many ways, all right? Uh, oil industry and this is you know with this one we're ra we're wrapping in here uh, because we're running out you know just out of time. Oil industry, do you see do you see uh, petroleum of Venezuela? keeping the course of whatever they have done right now, uh, El Ojo del Pino, um, staying, staying as a CEO of the company, uh, therefore trying to stop the decline in oil production this year. Um, well, so, I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen the reports that there may be a switch in the presidency of PDVSA this year. I think, you know, if it is Martinez who it replaces him, you know, in some ways you're swapping one technocrat for the other. Um, we don't know exactly how things would play out. I think it, it is happening in the context where we've been seeing Maduro trying to close ranks and putting people in high offices that he feels more comfortable with, which right. potentially raises a little bit of a concern. But um, I think that particular change wouldn't change my production outlook, which is to see another 10% decline in top line production this year anyhow. And I think that's a, a key concern is even if you are manipulating imports or getting debt relief from China, if you have 
production declining at that rate at you know over a steady period of time and you have legal concerns over new financing for the oil sector <coughs> uh, that's another just another reason why this picture looks unsustainable to me and you're talking about 10 percent decline that would that would that would take oil production total oil production in the country to what level pretty much around 2.2 if you're going off of pay to vases in the estimates. numbers mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's 250,000 barrels per day mm -hmm. and then minus domestic consumption so your right. exports production is lower exactly or export volume i should say exactly and for you as an investor you know when you, when you see mm -hmm. this and you hold, holding 2017 pay to vases 2017 um, and you see the profound changes that the you know, oil industry has endured in, in the past 15 years since Chavez took power. You know, uh, what do you make of the prospects of the company, Diego? Um, I think that the change from the Pinot to Martinez is a little more than cosmetic. I think that uh, now they are, s quote unquote, seriously trying to improve things. And you saw the uncovering of this lawsuit on some, uh, well, the reply to a, a lawsuit to a Middle Eastern company that was renting the, the drills and, and people being arrested. I think that there is an appreciation that they should be doing more mm -hmm. to reduce waste and make it more efficient. Obviously, you are it's too little too late, so the production may decrease still. But I think that it goes back to my point that if they were not acutely aware of the pathologies and that they need to address things, you wouldn't be seeing these things. And, and, and the fact that they want to have more joint ventures and it's part of the excuse of the Supreme Court and what they're yeah. doing. So, so for me, I don't think that it's nearly enough to change anything at the surface, but it just, it's another manifestation of the willingness to pay that even though they are extremely ideological, since uh, they changed Vice President to Tarek, the, the, it feels that the whole approach has been way more pragmatic than they used to be. And I think that's mildly encouraging for the sustainability of this until mm -hmm. the election. But I don't know, because again, it's maybe too little too late. Mm -hmm. But it's much, you see, a clear awareness that they need to be a little more serious. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Whatever. You know, maybe the little bird is <laughs> telling yeah. something the different. Pajarito, the the, the yeah. little President Maduro, you know, Chavez, uh, you know, impersonating him. Uh, Petróleos de Venezuela, from the cash flow of, of um, Venezuela, we know that represent, you know, pretty much 50% of the, of the nation's GDP. Um, 90% of total exports. Um, are you concerned with the future itself of the company, you know, in order to generate, to keep continuing playing that role? Uh, I think we were all concerned back in 2002. Yeah, with That was the start. Um, there's been a complete integration uh, with the sovereign and um, it's an oil company that does things that a typical oil company would do. So it's clearly compromised its ability to um, focus on its core operations. And we see that with every month monitoring a decline in, in production. So um, I don't know that that's going to change. It produces, as you said, the majority of dollars that the country needs, if not all the dollars at the stage. And that decision to where those dollars are funded are decided not necessarily by the company. So that's been the constraint for years, and I don't think that's going to change under Chavismo. Mm -hmm. Casey, your take? I think it, some of it also has to do with the regime change and how quickly you get in place a more investor-friendly environment, and, then you s and, and also what your hydrocarbons legal environment looks like in the post-Chavismo era and how 
a quickly investment comes in and, and but I mean it's a long term process I process think. But I also, you know, keeping in mind also the agreements with China, the agreements with Petrocaribe, there's oil that's being given away. I don't think China gets cut off on a regime change scenario, but maybe there'd be some renegotiation on that front. There's other in-kind deliveries, or Cuba is an example of where you might be able to free up some non-cash generating production and make it cash generating fairly quickly. But in terms of the long-term prognosis for the company, I think it'll depend much more on what the investment framework looks like. Co coincidentally, Russia is not only an issue in the United States and the relationship with the government, but also, but also in, in Venezuela with PDVSA and potentially Rafnef taking uh, you know, some you know, participations on equity in some of the, of the joint venture that PDVSA has al already, already in place. Concerned about this trend or the possibilities of, of that? They have to raise money where they can. And they provide That's all the idea. leverage. Uh, yes, and what? Uh, how is the reaction? I think that uh, the effort in the U.S. to put more pressure, I think it's worth it. And the Justice Department, with all the investigations about shady Venezuelan characters, but you know, you have to be careful with that because, in a way, that can give the government more uh, support. From the population, so you know, at the end of the day, at this stage, whatever the international community does has to be pragmatic and help, and really help the situation, and not, in a way, give ammunition to the current government to stay longer. Possibility of uh, because I haven't asked you this actually, Casey. Possibility of a, a credit event next year. What are the odds for you? Over fifty percent. Over fifty percent. I don't know how to handicap it. Well, I'll tell you next week after April twelfth. <laughs> well, come on, you're thinking well, it was a rain check, and Diego. Take like a rain check. I don't know. Now, apparently, according to CDS, it's just like ninety-two percent in five years. Hey, look, I think that still the odds of this government doesn't default. Uh, I think that you know, and it's irrelevant just to put a percentage in abstract. But I think, and that's why I'm long the seventeenth. I don't think that there is a great event this year. And I think that as long as it, this administration stays in power, it's very unlikely a credit event before the election. Before the election. On that note, I think we have to say thank you to all of you. Oh, we have, we have, a, we have a question here. Sorry for that, uh, you know. Uh. Short answer. Say again. Question. You didn't have the question. No. No. Who who would be a, a, a potential candidate to replace Maduro in regime change? Correct. And best equipped to implement that. Best equipped. I, I mean, listen. I think the interesting thing is this is years of policy mismanagement. Everybody knows what they need to do, right? The recipe is not that difficult. You need <coughs> the private sector involvement, and you need freely floating unified exchange rate and you need market prices. And I think everyone is aware of that situation. Um, academics discuss it, the business sector discuss it at length, at nauseum. They know what recipe, they know what needs to be done. I, I think the difficult part will be the consensus building and the transition itself because after years of running a chronic balance of payments deficit, the dollar mismatch between supply and demand is going to be extreme. So I think the bigger question is who's going to finance that transition? That's going to be difficult. I mean, you look at RG allowing for a free float. Well, it only allowed for a free float once it had dollars to support the currency. Yeah. And I think that's going to be the problem for Venezuela on the transition. And they'll have, there's plenty of, you know, expats or there's plenty of economists, Efreen, Crisante, mm -hmm. there's a million people. I think that the problem is, you know, getting to a transition and then they can agree what the, what the policy framework will be, but it, it's not going to be a surprise. I mean, we've, we've seen it discussed ad nauseum for years, I would say. But how long it could be? Because it's a very long time that you're suffering. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you need to fund it. That's why you need to fund it, right? And I, I don't think an IMF program in itself would, would allow enough funding for the transition. And that's an interesting question, too, because if you need to depend upon the markets for FDI, for the oil sector, 
or to fund the transition, then maybe you can't ask for a huge haircut on capital. Yeah, so yeah, there's yeah, all yeah, sorts yeah. of theoretical. Five billion dollars in the Venezuelan quota, 4.5, and an extreme measure, they can get three times the quota. That's 15 billion dollars, it's not enough. And that's why some private sector involvement to bridge the gap is needed. But the only thing that I would say, Argentina just finished the tax moratorium and 120 billion dollars went back to the country and they were very proud there because it, it's the world record. I think that when Venezuela does that, it will destroy that record. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because that's if they that's create that's the conditions, who knows? Two, three, four hundred billion dollars of Venezuelan money outside the country that left in the last 15 years. So I think it's very hard to. This is not a transition. This is a discontinuity. You get the right government, the right incentives. Who knows? It's going to be very tough, but it might be way less tough than it may look if the locals believe and bring the money back. But because you need a political transition first. Oh yeah. But one, it also one depends back. on the conditions of the transition, right? If it's an election and a new government coming in and you don't have sort of this rupture point, then it may be more difficult politically to enact some of the reforms that need to be made. To be made. Um, so it just depends also how much political capital someone has. But, and, and I think you also see the risk um, if they really go for it from the get-go, that you see some political instability in the process because it could be a painful move mm. back to a more a rational economic framework. One very last question there sure. for us. Sure, quickie. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a question for everybody, the panel and the audience. I'm curious who uh, would give me uh, you know, an even bet on there being elections next year? Um, you know, 10 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever. Who's willing to put money down on it there being an election in 2018? There will be elections in 2018. Mm -hmm. what, fair elections yeah, or unfair? Free and fair? What? No, 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 no. no. Definition. Could, no. <laughs> elections. Yeah. 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 Very few hands here for the record. You well, know? My yeah. base case is that there would be elections, but I'm not convinced they'll be free and fair. All right. So, well, how do you define <laughs> the Ecuador elections? Free and fair? You know? Mostly, okay, this mostly. is. Uh, yeah, but, that, that, but mostly, for another mostly panel, three yeah. percent mostly, it means that you swing the election one way or the other. Yeah. Fidel so. Castro says revolutions don't have elections that you lose. Yeah. So let's All keep right. that in mind. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, really. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah.